state house bombshell. A conservative lobbyist says Indiana lawmakers are planning what he calls a sneak attack to pass LGBT protections into the state's Civil Rights Act. But tonight, state lawmakers are calling his statements ludicrous. Erica, we're at the State House tonight, where the General Assembly is scheduled to meet back here in less than a month for the first official day of the 2016 legislative session that is called Organization Day. And in the past, has historically been mostly ceremonial. But in a four and a half minute video posted to his website and YouTube, Advance America Executive Director Eric Miller warns of a possible quote sneak attack here at the State House on that day, one to pass a bill that would offer statewide protections for the LGBT community. The children of Indiana are in danger. My name is Eric Miller. I'm the founder and executive. In the video, Miller says the sneak attack is being orchestrated by key political leaders and powerful special interest groups. He says Organization Day could go down in history as a dangerous day for both families and children. This is nothing more than the political establishment in the Indiana State House abusing the legislative process in order to take away your right to impact your government. This sneak attack must be stopped. Republican state lawmakers are responding to the claim on social media. In a tweet, House Speaker Brian Bosma says, let me be perfectly clear. There is no sneak attack plan for Organization Day. A simple phone call would have clarified that. And in a Facebook post, Senator Brant Hirschman writes that he consulted with Senate President David Long and says absolutely no legislation regarding religious freedom or LGBT issues will be debated or voted upon on Organization Day and has never been contemplated. We reached out to Eric Miller for a comment in a possible interview tonight, but did not hear back. So, Katie, are lawmakers able to approve legislation on Organization Day? They can. Erica, we took that question to the House Speaker's office, and they tell us that there's nothing in law to prevent lawmakers from passing something on Organization Day, but as far as they know, it has never been done before. A mass wedding has been held in Taiwan with 123 couples tying the knot in a joint ceremony in Taipei. And while gay marriage hasn't been legalized in the country, 10 same-sex couples exchange vows at the annual event for the first time. Over 16,000 couples have participated in mass wedding ceremonies hosted by the Taipei city government since 1973. But this is the first time same-sex couples have been permitted to participate. Despite no formal recognition of the union by the state, the participants were thrilled to be able to join in. I'm very pleased to participate in this event, sharing our happiness with everyone, because the more happiness we share, the more happiness we get. I hope our relationship is seen by everyone. Earlier this year, the government approved a revision of the rules of its mass wedding ceremony, enabling same-sex couples to register for the event. Taiwan is one of Asia's most gay-friendly places, Polls show a majority in favor of gay marriage and a study commissioned by the Ministry of Justice advocated legislation. Another church in St. Louis, Missouri this week burned, making it the seventh in the seventh this month. The previous six fires happened at predominantly African-American churches within a few miles of each other. But this latest one was a church outside the radius of the previous. And area media outlets are reporting the church's congregation here is largely white. Authorities say the churches have been empty at the time of the fires and no one's been injured. 20-year-old Austin Go used to work here at Kendrick Transitional Care and Rehab Facility. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. So far, he is not in custody. According to court documents, Go faces three counts of attempted sexual battery and three counts of sexual battery. The suspect is accused of trying to get one of the female victims to touch him sexually, but she told him no over and over. He allegedly forced a second woman to actually touch him. In total, there were three victims, two women and one man. The man has dementia. Paula Hoffman has a relative who is a patient at the facility. Is it upsetting to you that uh, someone they hired there to care for these people is actually abusing them? Yeah. It, it just, it's wrong. I really don't know how to say that it's wrong. Go denied the allegations against him. He was a new employee and it was his first job working with seniors in health care. The prosecutor wants it to be his last.
Anytime that there's somebody who's in a position of trust, be it with, with children or be it with people that you know, may have some special needs or are elderly, and someone takes advantage of that position of trust, it's something that you know, our office and this community takes seriously, and we want to do everything we can to hold people accountable and not allow that to happen again. A spokesperson for Kindred says it will fully cooperate with the investigation and that it conducts background checks for all its employees. Mexican police have found an 800 meter long tunnel used to smuggle drugs into the U.S. city of San Diego. It starts from the Mexican city of Tijuana and is reported to belong to the fugitive drug cartel leader Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Police said they detained 16 suspects and seized 10 tons of marijuana on Wednesday, October 22nd. Pictures taken from inside show the drugs were being smuggled using a rail car system. Over 850 packages wrapped in plastic and tape were waiting, ready to be transported. Authorities have described the tunnel as sophisticated because it was well lit, ventilated and built with metal beams to prevent it from collapsing. Mexican cartels have been smuggling drugs into the US through underground tunnels for years. Officials have not yet confirmed which gang was operating the tunnel, but it's thought it was built by Guzman's Sinaloa cartel, which operates in the region. The United Nations turns 70 this weekend. As it celebrates a milestone, it's struggling to keep up with endless conflicts around the world, along with sex abuse and corruption scandals. In New York, home to the United Nations, the UN means very different things to different people. Hope. Peace. Peaceful. Solidarity. Peace. World peace. Inclusive. Collaboration. Diversity. Influential. Complex. Complicated. Dysfunctional. Corrupted. Disgraceful. Obsolete. The mixed perception isn't surprising. In its lifetime, the UN has been divided by the Cold War, tested by conflicts from Europe to the Middle East, Africa to the Asia Pacific. It prosecuted war criminals, but now faces a high-level corruption scandal and accusations of peacekeeper sex abusers. It helped to end apartheid in South Africa, but failed to stop genocide in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur. I wouldn't say they're failings of the UN, except that the UN reflects the political constellation of power in the world. And in that sense, when the great powers can't agree to do something, it doesn't get done, at least not through the UN. The great powers are China, the US, Russia, France and the UK. The five veto-wielding permanent members of the Security Council, the UN's most powerful arm. The UN Security Council can impose sanctions and embargoes and refer war crimes to the International Criminal Court. But the UN's strongest body, it's also its biggest problem. Because when major powers cannot agree, they use their power of veto to block action and then little gets done. Recent divisions among the five permanent members have blocked action over Syria, Ukraine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The UN began in 1945 with noble intentions to prevent another world war, uphold human rights and international law, and promote social progress. But as the international organization turned 70 years old in a climate of escalating conflict, paralysis, and shaming scandals, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon appears to be losing patience. The Secretary General has kicked off ambitious efforts to fix the UN system from within, to hold its blue helmets to higher standards and reform the Security Council so it can do a better job of peacemaking and peacekeeping. This week, a Catholic aid group in the United Kingdom released a report on persecution of Christians. Among its findings is that Christianity is fast disappearing from the Middle East as Christians flee ethnic cleansing by radical Islamic groups. The report called Persecuted and Forgotten is published by the group Aid to the Church in Need. John Pontifex is the lead author of that report and he joins us now from London by Skype. John, thank you for coming on the broadcast. Listen, the report includes this disturbing statement. Christianity is on course to disappear from Iraq, potentially within five years. How did you arrive at this conclusion? Well, we have uh, quite clear statistics that show how many Christians there were in Iraq before the fall of Saddam. It was said before his fall in 2003 that there were perhaps a million or 1.2 million Christians. But if we look at what's happened since, the figures have declined very drastically. 
so that we're now looking at numbers in the range of 200 to 250,000 Christians, of whom about 100 or 150,000 are in fact displaced, and as a result, looking for an exit from Iraq. And, and, and to that point, John, what kind of help is needed to stop this massive exit and retain Christianity in the Middle East? Well, the first thing is emergency aid, because so many of them have been forced to flee their homes and are living in displacement areas where they are lacking basic food, basic shelter, uh, basic medicine, and all sorts of other emergency aid provision. And so aid to the church need is among those organizations providing that emergency help. Otherwise, these people would basically die. It's interesting that uh, you, you discovered in your report that it's not only in the Middle East, you're also seeing this level of persecution happening in Africa. Tell us what's happening there. Well, it seems that extremist Islam is making a definite bid for the soul of Africa, and particularly in Nigeria and in the surrounding countries, and also in East Africa, spreading down from uh, Sudan. Of course, Egypt has had its troubles, and right down to Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea, um, Kenya, and Tanzania have each, in their own ways, experienced an upsurge of extremist Islam, which has different names, uh, but has the same outcome, namely pressure on uh, those groups that it perceives as contrary to its express way of life. And Christians are in many ways top of the list to get rid of. Your country's Prime Minister, David Cameron, introduced, in fact, your report to the House of Lords. Tell us what he said. Well, he, he wrote a, a letter uh, to be read out at the uh, launch of the report and in it he spoke about what he called the systematic discrimination and exploitation of Christians who are driven from their homes and he commended this report saying uh, that it actually gives a voice for the voiceless. Uh, it's interesting because it's not just David Cameron but uh, uh, Pope Francis and other world leaders have spoken out against the the suffering church in the Middle East, but it appears that nothing is being done. I mean, your report, reports of what we've been doing for the last four or five years of the persecution taking place in the, in the heart of the Middle East, it appears that all of this is falling on deaf ears, that the United States, Great Britain, uh, is not doing enough in order to, to save this, uh, this uh, religion from extinction, right? Yes, it, it's absolutely clear that um, we see um, a disconnect between words, many fine words, of those who express concern and indeed dismay at the persecution of Christians and actions which are precious few. It's interesting, John, that even though there is terrible persecution, we're also hearing reports that the church uh, is thriving like never before. What do you make of that? Well, it, it is thriving in, in some parts, but we have to be clear that um, what really emerges from this report is the extent to which Christianity is being pushed back. We are certainly seeing what we would call uh, an, an ethnic cleansing motivated by religious hatred. We would certainly call it a cultural genocide, um, and we would see it as part of uh, extremist Islam's vision to rebuild caliphates um, and construct new ones, I hasten to add, and uh, drive Christianity not just from its ancient heartland, but from more recent places where it has sprung up. And it needs to be absolutely clear in people's minds uh, that this is a very genuine threat.